This meeting of the Board of Assessment is called to order. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is a public hearing conducted by the Door County Board of Adjustment. It will be conducted on a virtual basis, a first for many of us. Please be patient as we go through, as we work through the process. My name is Fred Fry, and I am the chair of the board. Other board members joining me from remote remote locations are Eric Weber, John Young, Bob Ryan, and Monica Nelson. They're also joined by Mariah Good, the director of the Archive Land Use Services Department. Rick Brower, zoning administrator, will serve as our clerk. We have six request cases this morning. The purpose of this hearing is to gather testimony on the cases on this morning's agenda. Applicants are encouraged to explain how the Lost sound. Sound John here. Can you hear John? I cannot hear. I, I cannot hear either. John and Monica, can you hear us? No, we could not hear Fred. He got cut off. Put a quarter in the machine. Can you say something? Where's Fred? Can you hear me now? That's right. John, Monica, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Okay, yes. Okay. All right. I think you have to talk Better. to these mics, right? But usually that's just for in the room. Monica and John, when we talk into the microphones like this, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay, you can hear me now? Okay, so everybody needs to talk right into the microphone. All right. So I'll repeat the purpose of this hearing is to gather testimony on the cases on this morning's agenda. If you are not a member of the Board of Adjustment, please mute yourself. I forgot to tell them to leave the refrigerator door. No, we told them yesterday. <laughs> I leave the refrigerator door open. I said, Whoever has the refrigerator door open, mute you yourself. We have food in it. <laughs> well, we had to tell them to Hope they're bringing treats. <laughs> yeah. That's for brunch. <laughs> Russell, Russell. Do you want him to ask you? real good. Patience, right? Yeah, that's true. And they can't throw but I want Monica and I want John. Yep, so we're going to make it easier to do that way. And then it's fine. I think it's just color two. Is John? Yep. Sure. And then was the other person? Monica, I think it's color two. She's on the phone. Yep, color two. Yeah, 45 minutes. Okay, Monica and John, can you still hear us? Yes. Yes. I can hear you. We think we have successfully muted everybody else. Okay. John and Monica, you can hear me also? Yes. Correct. Okay. So again, the purpose of this hearing is to gather testimony on the cases on this morning's agenda. Applicants are encouraged to explain how their interests are affected, how the public is affected, and to bring out any facts pertinent to your case related to public health safety, convenience, and general welfare. It is very important to address the three variant standards listed on the petition form. The procedure we will use this morning in conducting the hearing is as follows. I will read the notice and then call on staff for an explanation of the case. Following that, the petitioner or his or her agent will be invited to present their testimony. Next, we will take testimony and letters from others in support of the petition. That will be followed by any testimony and letters in opposition to the petition. Each side will then have a second chance for rebuttal. If you do not testify in the initial round, you will not be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. In order to testify this morning, you must have registered your intent and other specific information with the Land Use Services Office by noon yesterday. Before testifying, you will be asked to state your name and address for the record. Unless you are an attorney, you will also be sworn in. We ask that unless you are testifying or a board member asking a question, that you not interrupt the person offering testimony. If you are not testifying, we will ask you to turn off your audio in order to minimize the background noise. After all testimony has been received, 
The public hearing will be closed. Board members will make a motion and second to either grant or deny the variance. The board members will then take approximately 15 minutes to fill out our decision worksheets. After all the worksheets have been completed, we will discuss the matter and take a final vote. In order to grant a variance, affirmative votes from three or more board members three or three or more board members will be required. Any questions? Okay. Yes, this is John. Yes, John. Uh, as far as worksheets go, I didn't get any in the mail. You didn't? Let the mail on the wall. John, do you have a printer? John, do you have a printer at your house? Pardon me? Do you have a printer at your house? Uh, yes. We'll email you some right now. Susan's going to email you worksheets. Okay, if there are no questions, then let's proceed with the first case. Michael A. Lorenz petitions for a variance from section 3.12.4 of the Door County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, which requires accessory buildings that are, are constructed on vacant lots to comply with specific standards of the ordinance. This section of the ordinance limits the size of the buildings to 120 square feet, limits the height of these buildings to eight feet, six inches, allows only one entrance door, not to exceed six feet in width, and prohibits windows, skylights, patio doors, or other glazing in the building along with other limitations. Mr. Lorenz is proposing to construct a 672 square foot detached garage on a vacant parcel that is located across the road from his existing residence. The garage would be 18.5 feet high, would contain two eight by five foot wide garage doors and a total of eight windows. This property is located at 2478 South Lake Michigan Drive in section 27, town 27 North, range 26 East, and in a single family residential 20,000 square foot zoning district. Rick. Good morning. Um, Mariah, if you could go to page 20 in the packet, please. Um, the property is located along the shore of Lake Michigan. It's a little more than a quarter mile south of the Sturgeon Bay Shipping Canal. Uh, and as you can see, the property is bisected by a town road. Um, the residence is located on the east or the water side of the, the road and the proposed garage will be located on the west or the landward side of the road. Um, the zoning ordinance states that when a lot is bisected by a town road right of way, we must consider two separate parcels. Uh, so the garage will be going on a vacant lot located on the west side of the road. Now you can see that the parcel is surrounded by a vacant lot to the north. There's a town road. Well, the town road bisects the property. Uh, the resident, there, there's, well, the, the subject property, the town road is located to the east. There's a residence to the south and a wooded area to the west. Now, you're all aware that buildings on vacant lots are limited to 120 square feet in area and the other listed ordinance standards. The petitioner is proposing to construct a standard sized garage on the lot directly across the road from the residence. There is currently a 10 foot by 12 foot shed and an old outhouse on that portion of the property that will be removed. The proposed garage will comply with all other setbacks. And now Mariah, if you could go to page nine, please. Uh, this is the proposal and the standards are listed in what the, the Lorenz, um, the garage they're proposing to construct uh, is 24 by 28 with a wood exterior. It's 672 square feet. It would be 18.5 feet in height. 
that would contain two eight and a half foot wide garage doors and a total of eight windows. Now, the standards, and I go through those quickly, limit the garage to 120 square feet. It limits it to 18 six inches in height. It has to be made out of wood, which this would be. There cannot be any windows, skylights, or patio doors are glazing in the building. No more than one entrance door, not to exceed six feet wide. Um, so it's not going to comply with any of those standards. So um, that's all I have for right now, friend. Okay. Any questions by the board members of uh, Rick? I do. Okay, Eric. Let, let's look at the unique property limitations of this. It's bisected by a ruler. It was created, I'm assuming, many, many, many years ago. So we can almost look at it as one lot. But if you could emphasize on the windows and the doors limitation, that I'm more clear on that, and I think all of us are. Well, the ordinance used to prohibit any type of structure on a vacant lot, and now you're allowed to do the 120 square foot building with no windows, eight feet, six inches in height, uh, only one entrance door not to exceed six, six, six feet in width. And the original thought behind this was to discourage people from living in them. And uh, so could we permit it without the windows? Well, no. I mean, or would it become more compliable? Well, it would become more compliant, but it's still too big. It's too tall. No. The doors are too wide. Okay. Um, I had a question, Rick. It's about Ryan. Um, so this is deeded as uh, two lots, but built as one, or what's the? I forget what the term. I'm not sure if it's deeded as two, but I guess that's beside the point for the ordinance. And Sue might be able to answer that. It is one lot with one legal description outlining the entire parcel. It just happens that there's a total town right of way that bisects the parcel. Right. So it, it's one tax parcel number. Right. And if we were as a land sphere to create one, we can't have, we can't create it with a road bisector. So it predates that. Right. The way the ordinance is written, it looks at this as two separate lots because the town road right of way bisects the property. However, even though they use it as one lot, because of that fact, our ordinance thinks of the westerly side as a vacant lot, and therefore prohibits a perhaps normal sized garage to match the house on the other side. So even John and Monica, when Sue is speaking, can you hear her? No. Uh, it's, we can hear her. It's not quite as clear, but I got the gist of it. Thank you. Okay. You so into the mics. If they were proposing to put that on the east side of the road, it still wouldn't be compliant. The reason they're not proposing it on the east side of the road is there physically no room. Right, if there physically was room, is it compliant? Yes, yes. It would okay. comply with our normal detached garage regulations for single family residential 20,000. Okay. There's just absolutely no room on the water side. Right. I, I'm just wondering if, if we looked at it without the rule. Yeah. Yeah. So it would comply with our normal regulations. Right. It's just the fact that the road bisects the property that the ordinance looks at. Okay. Actually, state law does as well. It's two lots. Yeah. Public what, what, uh, this is about Ryan again. Would there, <clears throat> so you're saying that this uh, structure would be compliant if it was all one line? Correct. What's the most, uh, what's the, the biggest uh, building that they could put on there if this, if this was all one? Uh, if it were all one lot, mm -hmm. I don't have that information in front of me, and I'm sure Rick won't be there. Okay, just was curious. But they, they're not allowed to exceed the total floor area, meaning first and second floor, is not allowed to exceed the footprint of the single family residence. And it doesn't. Yeah. 
So basically any detached garage in this single family 20,000 district is limited by the size of the house. Okay. Item area. Thank you. Okay, and do we know the need to it? Need? Oh, can well, the petitioner will have to yeah, well, that address that. Okay. okay, any other questions for Rick? Okay, Mr. Lorenz is going to be testifying. He should be on and unmuted. Are you there, Mr. Lorenz? I am. Hey, uh, is your name it's and as far as the need for this building, uh, it's it's mainly for storage. Mr. Lorenz, before yeah, can you, you hear me? Could, yeah, could you please state your name and address? Yes, uh, Michael A. Lorenz. Address is N six zero four one Highway thirty two Sheboygan Falls, okay, and you swear Wisconsin. To, and you swear the testimony you're going to give will be the truth. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if I may address the, the, the need for this uh, building is, is, is for storage. Right now we have uh, an old outhouse and a, and a 10 by 12 uh, shed on the property in the area that we want to build this garage. Uh, we also have a lot of boats. This, if I can just, just give you a little history of this property, this was purchased in 1927 by my great grandfather. Uh, and I, I don't know about the road at that time, uh, I do know that the property passed from my grandmother to my father, uh, my parents, and who started building the cottage on the east side of the road in, in the early 60s. Um, and at that, that, at that time, there was no need for another, another building for storage. But the property has since been passed down to my uh, sisters and myself. And as our families get larger, uh, you know, they have a tendency to bring more toys up to the uh, Lake Shore. So that's the reason why we need a, a building of this size. It does meet the same size requirements as the, the cottage that's existing on the east side of the road. And, and you are correct, there is not enough room because of the width of the property to build a garage on the same side of Lake Lane or something Lake drive as a cottage. What kind of traffic goes down that road? Uh, well, you know, South Lake Michigan Drive is really not a road. It's it's more of a lane. It's a single, you know, with lane. So the amount of traffic varies from in the summer. Uh, I don't want to give you a, a count. I mean, it gets reasonably busy in the summer, but uh, the rest of the year, it's it's pretty much uh, pretty quiet along that. It's, there's a few residents that live along South Lake Michigan Drive between uh, Lake Lane and Servaldale. Uh, maybe about uh, maybe about ten or twelve residences that are permanent residents there. The rest are all uh, vacation homes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I, I, I have two. One, I work on that road quite often, and it, at any point that I've been on there throughout the year, it's not heavily or monitored even a little bit traveled. And um, as a board, we have to think about the expansion of family, that that's something we can't consider, that they have more toys. Well, uh, okay, I understand that. Uh, can I can I show you a photo of the area that, that is in question? I mean, I do, I can show you this if you allow me to do that. This is a photo of the, the existing uh, outhouse and shed that I would remove. The, the, the new garage would be constructed behind this, uh, that, that brown shed that's in the middle of the picture. Can you guys, can you see that? Are you asking? No, we can't see your we screen. Are you, you asking, it, is there a picture that's in the packet? If you told me a page number. Uh, <laughs> I I sent it in the email that I sent uh, for the registration. I don't know if you had that one. I, the the picture should be uh, up on the screen right now as I'm showing it to you. Right, but we're sharing my screen, not yours. Oh, you, okay. I put up page 19 of our Is this what you're trying to show us? Yes. Okay. 
what do you want us to see in this? Uh, I, if, if it's the, the lower picture is, is the area that, yeah, behind, yeah, that behind that, where that car is to the, to the right of that car is where the, the new uh, garage would be constructed. I would, you know, we're trying to make this garage look as aesthetically pleasing as possible. Uh, and it's in the 65 foot setback from the road, it would actually be very fairly invisible to for most that would see that. But it would, I, like I say, we clean up that outhouse and that shed existing. So I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to make the property look a little, a little nicer as well. How many of these trees will you have to remove? Uh, there's about three or four trees that I would probably have to remove. Uh, where I want to build this garage is actually on over a ravine. And to prevent, you know, and I didn't want to change the, the topography of the property that much, certainly not to affect the neighbors to the south. That would be uh, uh, Paul Gruby is the owner of that. And so I would construct this building uh, as a pole building, but with a wood joist floor. So I wouldn't need concrete in, in there and I can leave that ravine pretty much as is. I wanna to try to make it with a, the least environmentally, environmental impact as I can. That's all I have. Okay, any other questions? Uh, this is John, yes. I'd like to find out uh... What about the runoff for the entire property? Have you, has that been addressed yet? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Have you addressed the situation on runoff? Uh, well, that's that's why, like I say, I would, I, I would pretty much leave that ravine alone. Uh, it's really just a depression. So I, I wouldn't be changing any any of the 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 valleys or hills that are there. So it should really have zero impact on runoff. Based on what? Uh, uh, because it would be a various, uh, you know, I'm not gonna create a, a concrete slab and, you know, to re to excavate that to level it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it pretty much as is. Right. Uh, when you say based on what, is that on your personal opinion? Yes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Lorenz. All right, uh, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to give testimony in support of the petition? They were the only ones that registered. Okay, they were the only ones that registered. And uh, as far as letters go, we have a letter from, um, we have the, the vote from the town 3 zero in support of it. And we have a letter from Mike and Becky Boyer, who are neighbors in support of it. Are there any other letters? No. Okay. Okay, is there anyone uh, registered to testify in opposition to the petition? No. Okay, let the record show there's no one uh, to testify in opposition. Any letters in opposition, Rick? No. No letters in opposition. Okay. Then I will take a motion from a board member. I move we approve this request. Uh, Ryan moves to approve. Second. John Young second. John Young seconds. Okay. Then uh, Mr. Lorenz will take uh, about 15 minutes to do our worksheets and then take a vote and we'll go from there.
afraid of that, but she was in the morning. She, she don't want to make a woman to
<clears throat> Hello. 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 You're not a board of adjustment. Please mute yourself. I'm waiting for the Keller uh, Smith Trust. Right. Um, and we're working on a we're in the first case. case. Yours is last. Our estimated start time for yours is 1245. Okay, thank you. I you thought I'd try it. Um, John and Monica, will you let me know when you're done with your worksheets? Uh, I'm completed. Sorry for the delay. If we know what, what that building is, that. You mean the dimensions of the building? No, just go to the dimension on JS and go over to the road. I'll, I'll pull up the web app. Well, they, again, they, the easement doesn't run through the property to the north. Right. I understand that. that. It loops, though. He's asking. Oh, shoot. 
This is a better idea of how it's going to look compared to the right. Yeah, just for, like I said, for comparison to the board. A road that runs from that other garage we're looking at, and it kind of looks like it goes into the uh, property of the wall. It's in, it's in their drive, the driveway. For that. Yeah, they they'd have to explain it. It's some type of a shared driveway agreement they have that they connect. It, it's been there probably forever, but mm -hmm. okay. Just, just, that's fine. John Wall's back on. Did, did I'm not sure. I'm not. A, I'm not understanding the question about the driveway, but I can answer it. Okay, uh, I was just curious. Uh, the uh, aerial photo we have shows the driveway of the neighbor. Well, it didn't. It, okay. Let me finish. If you're not a board of adjustment member or the applicant for this case, please mute yourself. Okay, John. Yes. Uh, John Wall, uh, the aerial photo we have shows the driveway for your uh, northern neighbor coming down into your property for a little bit before it, it uh, uh, goes to the house. And yeah. Just, that's, uh, from what Rick said, I guess there's a shared agreement with you and the neighbor as far as use of that. Property. Yeah, we just, we just have a handshake before, if you notice, uh, our driveway that comes down to 12765. It kind of toward, goes to the northeast there, northwest. Yeah, um, that that wasn't there. Uh, neither was the driveway uh, north of that. So my neighbor, before we built our house, the northern neighbor um, put in that northern driveway, and that's how we accessed our property in order to to um, build the cottage. Okay, thank and, you. Yeah, it's it's that's that's. Yeah, the turnaround is the only original thing, and the and the old road used to go right through twelve seven sixty five. Just FYI. Okay, thank you. Now, hey, this is John. I have a question. Is there any kind of written document that we could put in our file that when this property sells and you're protected? In other words, I. I understood the question earlier that there isn't a document and I can just vision all kinds of problems 20 years from now. What's the problem we're trying to resolve here? So... John, I John Young, I, you know, I understand your question, but to me, that's something to be resolved at the time. I mean, I don't think that's part of our consideration of of the application here, just my opinion. I understand that. And I just wanted to make sure there isn't a document because the gentleman said, Mr. Wall said that there wasn't a document. I just want to make sure that there isn't a document until we get the paperwork done here. I, I'm not sure I understand that question. Eric, what did you want me to measure? The, the neighboring drive to the north? Yep. Or to, to the park? No. Again, the road doesn't go through there. So this is where I'm showing my okay. first. This I'm looking at it too right now. OK. So just so everybody else knows what we're looking at. Yeah. The only other thing, and without getting a recorded uh, deed, one thing I'm curious about is if there is a power line going through there that we're not uh, giving something or permitting something that would fall within an easement to that utility line. And I'm looking right now to see if I can find a, a survey showing where that utility easement would fall. Uh, John Wall here again. The 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 
the power line goes right down the middle. And the reason we're putting the garage up towards the road is to avoid that. Right. I'm just looking for a recorded document that records where that would bisect the property that we don't permit something that would go, you would put the building within that. Uh, do you have anything in writing when they do? Uh, I don't have anything in writing. I mean, that's the the the, the clearances are 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 required by public service. Um, Eric, would it help if they kind of give you an idea on the elevations here, where the power line runs through the property right now? I think you can superimpose the power line on that on your map there. Great. What I'm looking for is like a legal description describing if there is a, a legal description of a, a utility easement on that property. Could we set this forth as a condition? We decided to approve this or question for the for the I think that this is we're getting into it. This is the property owner's responsibility to to uh, comply with that and know where these power line uh, easements are. I don't think that's responsibility of this board. I just I don't feel good saying yeah you can do it. But you have to figure out is there a utility easement, and you're you're outside of it. Well, what what um, approvals does he have to get if we and if we approve the application, then he has to to apply for a building permit. Rick, what requirements does he have to, have to go through then? Will I approve the power lines? No, I mean that's the property owner's responsibility to know where his power line easements are. That's not a a zoning issue. I understand that, but I'm just saying that to, to Eric's concern, oh. will will somehow WPS or whoever's involved, will they need to, before it's built, does, does, does he have to consult with them? Or well, I would highly recommend that the property yeah. owner consult with Wisconsin Public Service. So is that is that something we can, I mean, uh, Eric, is that something you want to make part of the of a, a recommendation or just? Uh, as far uh, as their due diligence, I think. Yeah, the board we certainly should saying that it's yeah you know, well if we decide to approve it yeah but I I'm just wondering whether we're overstepping whether that's something that again as Rick says it's the responsibility of of the property owner and if if he doesn't do it and WPS objects to it then I think they have a you know there's an action they might take I'm I'm just not sure if it's I think it's good that we make the recommendation um, and suggestion that that be. Um, followed through on, but uh, I'm not sure that that um, whether we should make it a an actual condition on the approval. I think that the WPS is going to be involved with this because they still need to have power hooked up to this building. So, well, you have Correct. all maintenance of the of the line throughout you know history or their their history. Um, you know, if it goes over the garage and all of a sudden it becomes an issue and something happens to the building. You know, we have to think about what we're allowing right now or what we're approving. Right, but I think that if uh, he's still have to talk to WPS about his power hookup for this building, and I would think that there's a, an issue with them and the easement that, uh, that would be uh, figured out at that point. Um, and, uh, I think our, you know, our hands would be clean. Well, and the thing is, you got to think what, if it comes out of a, a road right away, it's fine. If it goes onto your property from the road right away, it's fine. But no, if you are the property owner to the north of me and your your power crosses over mine, I have to grant you an easement or sell you an easement. And now if your power needs to be restored and they need to come onto my property, that's where the issue becomes. If you look on page 27 of your packets on that survey, I don't know how wide the easement is, but I'm running my cursor. Look up the, down where the line is. So it looks like the line isn't going to go above the building. 
again, I don't know how wide that utility easement is. Well, it, it, this is John Wall again. The it's the requirement is, and I have gone through this multiple times with Wisconsin Public Service that any part of the building has to clear 10 feet away from either the top the power line or the ground line that runs under it uh so and we covered all that but do you have anything in writing no um i i think no, as I rick think. was saying it's my it's my responsibility to to require that to meet that uh clearance okay but the, this is john again in the event that you decide to sell, you're not going to get a clear title. You're going to have a cloudy title. I will, I will do my due diligence and try to resolve that. I think that's a wise move on your part. Okay, thank you. Okay, and just kind of eyeball the, the, the things there. That it's that 53 foot kind of diagonal line between the garage and the house is accurate. It certainly appears that there's more than 10 feet between the line and the garage. Okay, any other questions or discussion before we make a motion? Okay, I'll take a motion. I move we approve this request. Okay, motion approved by Bob. Second. Monica. Okay, Monica seconds. All right, so again, we'll take about 15 minutes to fill out our worksheets and then uh, discuss it and, and make a vote.
Okay, we're good here. Um, John and Monica, where are you in the process? I'm just finishing up in a minute. Okay. I'm finished. This is Monica. I'm finished. Okay. John, let us know when you're finished. Okay, done. Okay. Um, so everyone has completed their worksheets, so let's go through them one by one. Uh, consideration number one is unique physical property limitations. Does this property contain unique physical property limitations such as wetland presence, parcel shape, steep slopes, etc., that would prevent compliance with the ordinance? Monica, how did you answer? Uh, I answered yes. Um, the downward sloping of the land would mean excessive land disturbance and overhead electrical utility power lines prevent building elsewhere on the property. Okay. John? <laughs> this is not a big desk. Okay. Uh, For item number one, I said yes, but I put a footnote in there. There needs to be a easement granted by public service and, and, and the walls so that there is a clear title in the event that the property sells. Otherwise, there would be a cloudy title if we approve this and do nothing about it. Uh, protecting Mr. Wall. Okay. That makes okay. sense? Um, I know it does to Eric. No, I, I, I think it makes sense to all of us in terms of a wise move. I, I, I'm just not sure that it's something that's um, part of our purview on this application. But your, your concern is... I'll put in a nutshell the big green is the slope is the most logical spot to put this building. Okay, Bob? I have yes as well. Um, the property is accessed by a private road that has one other residence behind it. The location chosen for this structure is the best possible site on the property. The private road easement is the only need for this request. Okay, and I also said yes. I said elevation changes in power line locations make this a unique physical location. All right, um, question number two, which is unnecessary hardship. Unnecessary hardship exists when a literal enforcement of the ordinance would unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted purpose or when conformity with the ordinance standards would be unnecessarily burdensome. You have two options, A, which is because denial of the variance requiring compliance with the strict letter of the ordinance in question unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted purpose, or B, is conformity with the regulation unnecessarily burdensome. Monica? Uh, I answered B with yes. The request is reasonable and could Conformity would actually be a less environmentally sound option for the Niagara Escarpment. Okay, John? I answered no. And uh, C 
a letter attached. Okay. No, no to which, which question the interview. Hey. Okay. Eric. I put yes to B. Um, it is a reasonable request. The proposed location doesn't meet zoning, but it is the most logical place to put it on, on that particular parcel. All right, Bob? I had uh, yes for B as well. Uh, there's only one other residence uh, served by this portion of the road, and if these were the only two on the road, a variance would not be required. Okay, and I also had uh, yes for B, compliance with, with the regulation would involve considerable environmental disturbance because of the elevation and need to move the power line. Okay, and our final question is uh, public interest and intent of the ordinance. Um, does the granting of the variance result in harm to the public interest? Monica? I answered no. The private road in question is very lightly traveled within the area of the proposed garage. No safety issue is likely. Okay, John? I answered uh, no, and then C, the attached letter. Okay, Eric? I, I, put, I checked no. Um, the fact that the neighbors are okay with it, and the proposed building aesthetically would fit in with that area because I know what I'm working up there. And it, it is a unique road to Door County with a small volume of travel on it. Okay, Bob? I have a no as well. Uh, the town board has approved this. And I have no, I said this is the logical place to construct a garage of reasonable dimensions and requires a setback variance from a road that gets very little use. Okay, so we have uh, any need for further discussion. Okay, then we have a motion and a second to approve this petition. Bob, how do you vote? Yes. Bob Ryan votes yes. Eric? I vote yes. Eric Weber, yes. Monica? Yes. Monica Nelson, yes. John? Yes. No. Wait, John, you can't do that if you voted no. To I'm the sorry. I'm sorry. No. Okay, John Young votes no, and I vote yes. So the uh, petition carries by a vote of four to one. And again, I'm one here on proceeding, Rick. Yes, I mean, that's up to the board, but that's reasonable, yes. Okay. Then I think we're good to go. Okay, Mr. Wall, thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Brian Saunders. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're echoing. Turn off on your computer. You still there, Brian? Yeah, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, anybody need a okay? All right. Okay, so now we have our third case. Um so Ms. Graham, are, are you on for the are you on for this call right now? Brian Zach is representing. Brian, oh, Brian, you're on, okay. And then uh, were you here for the opening statement at nine o'clock? Uh, I somewhat listened to it, correct. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yes, I was. Okay, very good. So our third case is from the town of Sebastopol. Mary J. Schramm petitions for a variance from section Roman numeral 4.b.2.c.2 uh, of the Door County Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, which requires structures to be located at least 51.5 feet from the ordinary high water mark of Clark Lake. The petitioner proposes to construct a 26 foot by 36 foot two story single family residence with a five foot by five foot entry stoop on the north end of the residence 
which will be located as close as six, at 36 feet from the ordinary high water mark and the west side of the residence located outside outside of the non-conforming footprint of the original residence will be located 44 feet from the ordinary high water mark. This property is located at 5490 West Shore Drive in Section 3, Town 28 North, Range 27 East, and in, the, in a single family residential 20,000 square foot zoning district. Rick? Give me that down, please. Um, Mariah, if you could go to page 67, please. Um, and the property is located along the west shore of Clark Lake, and it's surrounded by the town road to the north. Uh, Clark Lake to the east is a residence to the south, and another town road to the west. Um, if you could go to page 52, Mariah. Okay, um, um, now there's currently a 22.3 foot by 36.4 foot two story single family residence with a seven by 14 covered porch located as close as 22.5 feet from the high water mark of Clark Lake. Now the applicant is proposing the re to replace the residence with a new residence which will be located six feet further from the ordinary high water mark of Clark Lake and remove the existing covered porch. Now the majority of the new residents will be located within the non-conforming footprint of the original structure, which does not require a variant. However, there's a five by five stoop on the north end of the residence and that's highlighted in yellow. Um, which will require a variance, as well as the west side, uh, which is located 44 feet from the ordinary high water mark of Clark Lake. And these, both of these areas did not fall within, or the proposed areas did not fall within the footprint of the existing structure and do not comply with the required setback. And for that reason, those areas basically highlighted in yellow. Um, require the variance. Um, the, it's, the proposed home is a two-story. It's approximately uh, 27 feet high. Uh, it's a 26 by 36, uh, approximately 1,872 square feet total. Again, well, the existing home is a two-story also. Um, I think that's the portion of the home. Well, that would that would be the existing home, and uh, the paint. Um, that's. You can see it says approximately 108 square feet of grade patio with a five by five stoop. Um, and uh, the greenish area, it says it's gonna return approximately 240 square feet to natural vegetation. So that's the limits of the existing building and the proposed is gonna go back further than that. So basically, if you look at the, the, the buildings being pushed back the left with the yellow part being new part of the building and the pink and green or whatever it is, that's that's area that's going to be returned to not being a building. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Rick? Okay. Ryan, I assume you're going to be the one testifying here. Yes, correct. I'm representing okay. Mary Schramm today. All right. Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Uh, Brian Zock, 8454 West Pine Ridge Circle, Bailey's Harbor, Wisconsin, 54202. Okay. And the testimony you're going to give will be the truth? Yes, it is. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. 
Okay. Um, basically, going to address the three three limitations or the three areas surrounding the application. Uh, the first one being unique property limitations. Um, as you can see on the site sketches that I did provide that are up on the screen, uh, the present configuration of buildable area is very narrow, uh, thus allowing the setbacks and so forth. The dash line that the cursor is going around right now is what is indicating the buildable area, but if everybody sees within that buildable area, the existing well is on the north side of the driveway, and then the holding tank uh, would be on the south side of the driveway. So that's kind of limiting the buildable area or, or the area that I can push the house to. Um, the town uh, road to the north requires a larger setback, uh, thus creating a smaller buildable area. Uh, normal side yard setback would be 10 feet versus the 65 feet now required from East Town Line Road, which is the north portion of the property. Um, if Town Line Road was not there, uh, we'd be able to use the lot to the north, which would be on the north side of Town Line Road uh, for averaging. Um, as I mentioned, the existing well and septic limit the reposition of the proposed house uh, west on the lot. Um, I'm asking for minimal relief with the variance in the allowable buildable area and still allow you know for a future detached garage. So what I'm asking basically is two foot six or thirty inches. Uh, as far as public interest, I do not see that there's any harm to the public interest here. Uh, proposed new residence be located in the existing location of of the existing house, thus no interrupted views to any of the neighbors. Uh, existing tree line at the road edges and water edge to remain, so there will be definitely a buffer that does stay. And like I said, that's not, not inhibiting anybody uh, in the surrounding area. Uh, by moving six feet to the west in the buildable area would allow the 100-year floodplain elevation to be met. Uh, minimal tree cutting to be performed to build a proposed new residence, which is basically existing trees that are around the existing footprint or the existing house. Uh, those do have to get removed uh, for the new structure. Uh, allows for a gentle backfill to the east uh, towards the lake uh, versus being a, a, such a drop or a, a subtle, or not subtle, but a a drastic drop towards the lake, let's put it that way, uh, does not affect any drainage issues uh, to this lot and or neighboring lots um, because everything would be pitched as far as back to the keep there. Uh, unnecessary hardship, um, I came up with a few. Without the grant of the variance, um, this does not allow this parcel to be used for its intended use or you know, for residents. Uh, Two-sided averaging cannot be used to determine the setback um, based on, you know, East Town Line Road and so forth to the north. Um, only being able to use two setbacks limit the buildable area uh, with the water setback. Um, like I mentioned, that buildable area being indicated in the dashed lines and, and what's there ready for the holding tank in the well, I'm only looking for two foot six. Uh, allows that buildable area if they ever did or present owners decided to move forward and want to go to a detached garage and or in the future for sale, it does allow that buildable area to be there for a uh, future detached garage. Um, and the existing house as it sits right now is not, not a year year-round residence by any means. It sits on a rubble rock foundation um, with basically boards that kind of control the access to that area and, and the drain down and everything is underneath. So what we're proposing to do is, is allow for a year-round structure uh, compared to what's there and, and basically in its, its declined, declining state as a, as a residence. That's pretty much all I have. 
Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for Brian? Okay. No questions. Um, hey, Brian, thank you. We don't appear to have anybody else who's registered to um, testify in support of the petition, correct? correct? And we have a letter in support of the petition from a neighbor, um, Linda Waite. Any other letters in support? No. Mm -hmm. So did we ask the town for did the town put the standing vote or any standing in the packet? No, no response. Okay. And um, we don't appear to have anybody registered in opposition to the petition, correct? That's correct. And no letters in opposition? Yeah, we did get a letter yesterday from the DNR. So okay. I'm gonna summarize it. Um Basically, the first two paragraphs of the letter, um, you know, they restate the request. Then the next three paragraphs deal with the criteria and the bottom line for unique physical limitations. Uh, when determining if compliance is prevented, the whole parcel must be considered. Using setback averaging, the compliant building location on this lot for a larger cottage home and a future detached garage. The fact that the existing cottage is so close to the water is not a unique feature of the property. And then under no harm to public interest, uh, in summary, cumulative impacts of expanding existing structures closer and closer to the lake and have a detrimental impact on fisheries, water quality, natural scenic beauty, et cetera. Because the existing cottage is too close to the ordinary high water mark, any lateral expansion can be detrimental to the public interest. And then under unnecessary hardship, uh, accessory structures such as detached garages do not qualify for setback averaging. So the garage will also need a variance and under the county ordinance, we'll have to go through a road setback variance before a shoreland setback variance can be considered. Because the garage cannot be placed in the buildable area that meets the road and shoreland setback, the new house could be placed there and not require a variance. Although there are many provisions to allow a non-conforming structure to remain, all the standards look at trying to protect the 35-foot buffer area. Moving the structure back to 51 feet to the 51 foot setback would minimize encroachment into the 35 foot buffer and would not create the need for another variance for the proposed garage. And uh, this is signed sincerely, Kathy Kramaz. It's K R A M A S Z, Water Management Specialist for uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Okay, what what am I, am I seeing a detached garage? Yes. Well, they were talking about that in the future. Okay. So uh, we don't need to take that into consideration right now. Well, you can as a whole, but the, he talked about doing that in the future. So what is the variance for it today? For I mean, what 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 does this board need to look at? Technically, just what's before you today, yes. And that would be the back or the west side of the house and the little uh, stoop on the north north end of the house. Yeah. And again, maybe I misunderstood something, but the DNR letter talks about expanding the footprint, and it looks to me like we aren't expanding. There's no additional square footage. I mean, I haven't done the exact math, but we're simply moving the building back a few feet from where, where it was and it's the same size. Is that correct? Well, they're expanding to the west. And expanding. I mean, our impervious is the same, right? Footprint is staying the same, it's just moving back. Essentially, yes, but it's not on the same footprint, or not on the same footprint. Right, it's the same structure, but it's getting shifted further away from the high water mark. 
I believe it is slightly larger as yeah. far as a footprint, but not by a lot. I was just grabbing uh, the current home is 22.3 by 36.4, and they're proposing 26 by 36. Okay. Uh, Rick, um, what would be the limitations if this the same size structure was located a little further north and further back from the uh, high water mark as the DNR is suggesting? Bob, would you repeat your comment, please? I didn't get that. I, I would like to know uh, where what the setbacks would be for this building that was uh, done north of the current site in the area that the DNR talks about being um, uh, more eco-friendly, for lack of a better term. Is the best line here the correct building envelope? Yes. Okay, so does that answer your question, Bob? It's on the screen, it's the dashed line. Right, but there would have to be a setback from the well, I'm assuming. Um, in that well, way. right. That's so, to relocate the well, then. Yeah, I mean, they're they're not taking, yeah, you can't build over the top of the well without DNR uh, variances. And uh, obviously, that buildable area doesn't take the, the tank holding tank or whatever that is a septic tank and the well into consideration but holding our septic tanks and wells can be relocated i guess is the bottom line but if this building was moved to the north uh portion of this lot and uh sent back further from the water what kind of uh variance would be required to uh, do that between the, the two roads well, I mean, again, what Mariah stated that it shows the buildable area. So if they, I'm not sure if I, I that I understand your question. Just need a variance from the East Town Line Road. Is that what you're asking about? Uh, I, I just got curious as to um, the DNR proposed something for the North as being more acceptable. Mm -hmm. So uh, this building envelope that's on this map here, if uh, or the site sketch. If that this structure was moved in into that uh, buildable area and uh, was enough was far enough away from the well, I guess it would need a setback or uh, it's from East Town Line Road. Is that accurate? Okay. Um, I think what they were saying is that the home could be built within that building. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the. The garage could not be placed in there because a garage has to meet a 75 foot setback. So saving that area for the a future garage makes no sense mm -hmm. because it, it it wouldn't comply. They need a 75 foot setback. Uh, so they're saying, why not build the residence in, in that buildable area and then mm -hmm. deal well, with it? And if, if they did decide to do that, they would have room uh, south of the structure for a garage. It, it might have to be attached. Setback reasons for possibly. I didn't think all those options through, I guess, to be honest. Um, is Brian still? Uh, can I ask Brian a question? Yeah, if, I'm on. I'm on. Uh, Brian, what, uh, what would be the problem with having this uh, building uh, in the area which the DNR has described for it? The well and how that whole well, let's address the well first. And then the well, I'd have to pay the trim, but after the whole well. That can't fit with John Clark Lake, um, they have minimal openings, and by keeping the house in the same pretty much footprint, they're not going to have to open up any more viewing corridors. So, um, and yeah, and <laughs> what is the difference? This is John. What is the difference in the topography from a surveyor standpoint? And if we have them move that house versus where it's at now, it looks like it's at, if I can read this right, 5490. Well, it's technically an unstudied lake. Um, yeah. It's an independent dam. And knowing, I know the parcel that we're talking about. I've yeah. pulled the floodplain, the current floodplain map up on the screen, I believe. I'm in the right place. Okay. okay. 
So if we if the house was moved north, it would be in the flood plain. We're on the current map. Assuming that the elevations on the land matched that, yes. How much uh, higher would that could the house be relocated to the floodplain? So uh, it's not wetland. It can be placed in the floodplain. Additional fill would be required. Right, right now they're they're adding some fill to to grade it back to natural grade. But if in the floodplain, then they have to put in fifteen feet of fill around the entire structure at a specific elevation before then sloping it down to natural grade. So you'd end up having a much larger land disturbance than the occupied footprint, I guess. We Okay, so or maybe one of the three, would you agree with me that the way that that floodplain is shown is merely suggestive and 80% of the time that somebody goes out to shoot grains, we can remove them from that floodplain. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a very poor map and you just alluded to it that they are working hard to change it but it hasn't happened yet. So just my opinion from doing it, that is really significant. So that is true, um, especially on our three inland lakes, the floodplain as shown in red on our web maps is not accurate. And that's because it's based on different mapping techniques and different numbers for the floodplain. So even though it shows as red the way it is there, um, surveyed elevations would be required to determine if it's truly in. And I just don't have that information. They, they took elevations where the proposed project was. And, and so I don't have anything to tell you for certain if it's in or out. Do you know if they, when they uh, determined this, do you know if they took into consideration the managed level of Clark Lake? Yes. So the new maps will be based on that, and the actual new elevations are fairly close with what we're using now. Um, the problem being mapping it today, um, they're using a local datum in the 100s where our contours are in the 500s, so there was no good way to map these areas. Um, with the new maps, they translated um, their engineered studies so that it could be related to the 500 numbers or 600 numbers that we're using in the area. So the new maps will be much better. Um, but this is what we're left with for today. So don't, don't rely on that picture. <laughs> like they said, you mirror, they uh, might be larger than yeah, I can't grab a kid. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think we've had some good discussion, and I don't want to cut her off if we need to go further, but we're kind of falling off our intended schedule here. Um, and to me, um, I guess I look at the two extremes. One is to leave the current structure where it is and not do anything, with, which is the option of the owner, in which case we will be stay closer to the lake than we are now. The other option, which Bob kind of explored, is to move it way to the north to the buildable area, but that takes into consideration a lot of uh, changing around of, of the utilities on the property, plus takes out a lot of vegetation. Um, so to me, then there's the, the compromise, which is what they're asking is to build a reasonably close sized structure a little bit further back. Um, still not be compliant, but that's what we're being asked to look at. Is that a fair assessment by everybody? Okay. So, um, again, unless there's further discussion, then I think we need to take a, a motion and a second. Eric Weber makes a motion to grant as um, submitted. Okay, Eric makes a motion. Monica second. Okay, Monica seconds it. All right, so now let's go to our worksheets and again take about 15 minutes. Hold on, Did you bring the whole
Okay, we're done here, gang. Um, Monica and John, where are you? I'm done. Just finishing my last sentence. You could start, um, Fred. Okay, sounds good. So uh, the uh, first consideration is unique physical property limitations. Does this property contain unique physical property limitations, such as wetland presence, partial shape, steep slope, et cetera, that would prevent compliance with the ordinance? Eric? I checked, yes. Um, the interesting thing on this parcel is that it's bounded by the north, south, and east, road, which changes the averaging from setbacks from the right away. Neighboring houses, which is another unique, unique thing that we can't completely use averaging. We can only use one. And that ultimately creates a unique building zone. And the, re, the, the request would bring the structure closer to compliance. Okay. Uh, I had no. Uh, there is room on the parcel to build this house that will conform to the ordinance. And provide a more acceptable second for the uh, overgrown. Okay, Monica. I said yes. Um, there's a narrow buildable envelope which now contains the well and septic system. Moving construction of the residence to this site would gain approximately six feet from the ordinary high water mark, but also require greater land disturbance than allowing a rebuild, which the ordinance does allow. Um, with little change to the footprint and is much more reasonable considering the current ordinance. Okay, John? Uh, I had, uh, yes, the uh, home can be built in the uh, proposed site. However, uh, no garage if uh, home is moved and they could have a Okay, kind of breaking up on us, John. Can you get a little bit closer to wherever you're talking to? Microphone or whatever. Okay, I guess we got the gist of it. You voted yes. How is that? That's better. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So I also said yes. I said uh, the question and answer don't exactly match the circumstances here. Technically, there is a buildable space. Uh, but a new that a new dwelling could be moved to. However, doing so would entail considerable disturbance of the land. Consideration number two: unnecessary hardship. Unnecessary hardship exists when a liberal enforcement of the ordinance would unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted use, permitted permitted purpose, or when conformity with the ordinance standards would be unnecessarily burdensome. <laughs> And a choice of A, which is there's denial of the variance requiring compliance with a strict letter of the ordinance provision in question, unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted purpose, or B, is conformity with the regulation unnecessarily burdensome. Eric? I check yes under B. Um, a lot of the reasons it are following to my answer for question number one. But with a little extra under that, what they're asking for is an update. They're, you know, they're looking to update their home, they're going to bring it to 100% value of flood insurance. And it's also a structure, or a, a, it's, a, it's a minimal request as far as this, the change in impervious of what they're going to do. So ultimately, what we're doing is what this board wants to do, bring it more into compliance. We're going to get it in the flood value, and we're not going to create any more um, impervious, per se. Okay, Monica. I also answered a yes and B, and I would agree with everything Eric said. John? Ditto. Okay, <laughs> and I, I'm also a ditto. I've said yes to uh, to B for and referred back to my answer to, to uh, question one, which is very much the same as what Eric uh, detailed. 
Okay, the final is Yeah, I have the voice. You may. I voted no. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of anticipated that. <laughs> you were eating the way. Just there is a conforming billing site on the, on the parcel. Okay. Bob, did you have a uh, no for B or A? I had no for A. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sorry about that, Bob. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And our, our final uh, question has to do with public interest. And the question is, um, in order for the variance to satisfy the public interest test, the question below must be answered negatively. Does the granting of the variance result in harm to the public interest? Eric? And I'm just for the record, I'm going to say that I check no, it reduces the flood hazard, it's a very small request, it's a very small footprint uh, change. Okay. Bob, I have not forgotten you. I have a good memory, just not going to ask for anymore. I had yes. Um, with the water quality concerns that are being noted more and more, the public interest seems to be moving towards more buffering from our service waters. Okay. Michael? Uh, I agree with Eric, plus uh, the fact that this request actually moves the residents further from the ordinary high water mark, so that would be in the public interest. Okay. John? I said uh, no, and uh, I'm going to come up with an excuse yet. <laughs> okay. And I also said no. I said while the proposed new residence will not be ordinance compliant, the new setback is an improvement. Uh, the new dwelling will be essentially the same size and close to the existing location. Minimal disturbance of the land will occur. Okay, I don't know that we need any discussion. Let's, uh, I think we can move to the vote. Uh, let's take Bob first. Uh, Denied. Bob says no. Eric? I grant. Eric says yes. Monica? Grant. Monica says grant. John? Grant. John is a grant, and I also say aye. So we have a vote of four to one to approve the uh, petition. Okay, and I assume, gentlemen and ladies, that we want to put in the one year. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So we are good to go on this one. We're all in favor. Um, I'll say what? I mean, I mean, it passes. It passes. Per, yeah. Yeah. Passes by four to one. Yeah. Okay. So we are we are good from our end. Thank you, Strams and Brian. Appreciate your testimony and good luck with your project. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we have, we move to the town of Union. Do we have um, the petitioners on the phone here? They have a representative from now and associates, Mike Andrasco. He's gonna be the only one testifying that I know of. Okay, so Mike Andrasco. All right, and Mike, are you on the uh, phone for the opening statement about the procedures we followed? I was not. Okay, do you need to hear them? No, I think I'm fine. Essentially, we'll, we'll read the uh, petition, get the comment from Rick, um, go to the uh, testimony in favor of, which will be you, go to the testimony in, in opposition to, and then work off of our worksheet. So that's kind of the, the, the Cliff's Notes version of it. Okay. Okay, so this case is Lois Giese and Joseph Dalsing on behalf of Scott Giese and Barbara Johnson Giese. Petition for a variance from section Roman numeral 4.b.2.b of the Door County Shoreland Zoning Residents, or, excuse me, Door County Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, which requires structures to be set back at least 75 feet from the ordinary high water mark of a navigable stream on the north end of the property. The petitioners propose to construct a 31 foot by 41 foot two story attached garage, a 10 by 21 foot laundry room entryway and a four foot 4.5 by 10 foot covered porch which will be located as close as 48 feet from the ordinary high water mark 
of the navigable, navigable stream. This property is located at 225 Bay Chapel Lane in section 32, town 26 North, range 23 East in the town of Union. Rick 